Hey y'all, welcome to Southern Soul Chats. We are thrilled to have you with us today. As we prepare for season four, we're taking a short break to reflect on the powerful teachings from our last season, First Steps. So last season, we dove into Foundations of Faith where we explored who God is and his purpose for humanity. Now over the next few weeks, we'll be revisiting real life examples of people who have taken their first steps forward with God in their lives. These are past episodes featuring individuals who are on a journey of discovering a deeper relationship and trust with God, and their stories beautifully illustrate the transformation that happens when we align with His purpose. We hope these testimonies inspire you to continue your walk of faith. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode four of Southern Soul Chats. Today, is our episode is Rescued by Grace, and I am excited to have the wonderful Heather and Donnie Mosher here to join us. So Hi. welcome, Hello. guys. Hi. They uh, have a podcast and a radio show called RRR, which is Relevant Recovery Radio. And what's the station? KPRC 950 in Houston. Sundays, Sundays at, at 1. 1 p.m. Central. Or you right. can download the iHeart app. It's free. And all of our past episodes are on iHeart. Yeah, and well, I've listened. They're good. They're we're, really we're good. We're all right. <laughs> it's better when he's not there. I Just always me. say it's, it's, nice. it's two idiots <laughs> with a microphone. I, why didn't you name it that? Because My her boss. boss wouldn't let us. <laughs> It's through so, my work. So they, they sponsor us. Yeah. And, oh, um, they got to keep it nice. They want yeah. us to act a certain way that we have trouble with. Well, you, you have trouble with. Yeah. Oof. Mm, I understand that. Mm, mm. <laughs> yeah. So today we are going to be exploring uh, your personal journey through addiction, recovery, redemption. I mean, everything but the kitchen sink and how that has shaped your life and even led to this podcast that right. you guys slash radio show you have, which I'm sure years back, if somebody would have told you that, you'd been like, wait, what? We're it's still crazy. like, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, is this real? <laughs> I'm only on episode four and I'm still like, wait, what? I don't know if it'll ever go away. Like ever. Well, I mean, and, and still to this day, people are like, you have a radio show? I'm like, yeah, I'm still shocked. Yeah. Yeah. Somehow. Somehow, um, we do. I don't. Yeah. And I, like I said, I've listened it's, to one of your episodes and I, your dynamic together is just like sitting with you guys outside of that mm. and, and watching you interact. So you feel like you just like, Oh yeah, we're at home here. here that's we go. the magic of it. Because when my, uh, CEO originally asked me to take over the radio show and be the host, I actually said no. And I was not interested in, in doing that. And cause I'm not just trying to like be on the radio. Um, but he was kind of forceful that, you know, you should do this. And Because didn't you, you filled in like I filled twice. in several times, You yeah. helped him twice. And then he was like, hey, I'm going out of town. You do it. Yeah. And you said. No. And then he was like, yes. And then I was like, well, if, if I am the host, then I get to do it with my husband. Because I know our banter between each other. And I know what he's going to say and how he's going to explain things when it comes to addiction and recovery. Yeah. And we have to actually tone our banter down for the radio. Yeah. You imagine that. Yeah, so I'm just trying to have a snitch. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been doing that about... Two years, two and a half years. We are 119 episodes, 52 <sighs> weeks, so we're over two years in. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. you are. It's cool. It's God. I'm trying to be <laughs> you when I grow up. But I, I always, <laughs> I make the joke. Uh, it's two idiots with a microphone. Like, there's nothing that qualifies us. I no. think the only reason that we're successful is we do honestly try to be just real, just Helpful. who we are. Yeah. I, I don't even know if we're helpful. I, I know that we just try to be authentic. And, yeah. and the authenticity is that um, we're broken. We're idiots. Yeah. Like, we're just doing the best we can. And I think due to our own past experiences, I mean, it's a it's a podcast and a radio show about recovery, and which Donnie and I are both in recovery ourselves. And through this journey, we've helped a lot of people get sober and stay sober and find happiness or find a connection to God. And, and so we do have that experience that we bring to the table, but how to translate that into a radio show or a podcast is a whole mm -hmm. different challenge. And so it's been bumpy at times, Yeah, and but we, we found uh, our groove, I think. We, we have covered everything from drug and alcohol addiction to food addiction, to gambling, to porn addiction, to social, social media, media addiction. Mm -hmm. I love to pepper Jesus in, um, pepper. Yeah. I like to pepper Jesus <laughs> Just in. Just pepper him a little bit. I, so Is that hard? Because you're, you're it, not on Christian radio. It's not, not Christian radio. And so here's, here's when we knew we were doing it right. Um, Heather's boss married the CEO of the company, and at the wedding, a couple came up to us that we, we had we never met before. We did not know these people. <clears throat> and they said, oh, my God, we got to know. Believers, 
And we said yes, and they said, we knew it. We knew it. <laughs> because we had navigated the podcast, the episodes, in a way where we were peppering it in, and people would suspect that we are believers. Right. But we weren't straight up out with it in case we were tr- we were trying to win people that maybe don't want to hear that sort of thing. Right. We were, we were delicate with it. And right. it's not something that we want to hide. Right. It's not something that we're trying to to have Stifle. a veil around. Here's what it is, and, and it'll, we'll probably get into it when we sort of share a bit of our story. Before I became a believer, I was a staunch atheist. I mean, a militant atheist. And when I hit the 12 steps, the doors are so wide open to everybody walking in the door that it was attractive to me. It didn't scare me away mm-hmm. with the, the Christian, you have to believe in Jesus. You have That's what I've been running for my whole life. And so I think that's the way we do the radio show. We are not shy about talking about God. No, we and we not, don't, we're not even doing it for PC reasons. Uh, right. We just want uh, the help we offer, or the information to be as attractive to as many people as possible right. with the door wide open because yeah. we would like to try to get them sober first. Because right. it sure worked for us. <laughs> it worked right. for yeah. you know? Right. Yeah. So, Which make, it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense, yeah. actually. So here's what I want to do. Um, I want you guys to eat each share just a brief overview of like your individual journey mm-hmm. right before you two became one and then we'll merge into how we'll start there we'll merge into how you two how we met got together so we're gonna go up to about what late 2017 and then we'll see where you go what yeah <laughs> are you gonna go first no you go do we have to play rock paper scissors no you, let me you ask you this is on a, a platform where we're not going to curse, but anything goes. Yeah, right? I mean, yeah, so. I'm the same way with you guys. Like I, you know, I'm going to recommend that you don't hold anything back. Don't okay, worry about me or my feelings. Your feelings? Because there's certain you things. Have that feelings? That, what? Th- there's certain things that she shares doesn't share in her story. But I'm telling you today, let it out. Go for it. Yeah, because for me, I feel the Whatever same way comes you out, do. Comes out. Okay. Like I mean, we all we go to church together. We all do the whole church yeah. scene. But like for me. This platform is really just about keeping it real because there are people who feel like when they come to church, they just get that real pretty covered over version of everything. Right. And so you can't come and talk about how you cussed your husband out on the way to church and you can't come and talk about how your kids are driving you nuts and you Mm -hmm. want to just quit life and run away. Mm -hmm. So in in this space for me, I just want to be real. And so that's like the first three episodes we did. I just shared my story and just kept it really real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just told the truth. Like, this is who I am. This is, and if you don't like it, then, you know, you have five bazillion podcasts to go choose from. I have a really hard time with the, the small talk stuff that isn't real. You know, I don't know how to do small talk with people. So jump in girl. And so, okay. So I grew up in a very Christian home. I grew up with wonderful parents. I went to a Christian private school for a few years. Um, my mother is Pentecostal and schizophrenic, so that makes for a real fun childhood combo. Not only has the Lord Jesus come back, he done talked to her about a week <laughs> yeah. ago. And he she's writing rapture day. letters to yeah. everybody right. in the family. Like, right. get ready. Right. Um, and is she disappointed because those haven't come to pass yet? That's <laughs> all I want to know. <laughs> my mom literally is one of those people that have the keychains for her car keys. It says, if the rapture happens, the car's yours. Like, she's just real ready, you know? Nice. So it's so adorable. My, my dad is Southern Baptist. And so he Oh, hated so you were like a Pentabaptist. Yeah, Pentabaptist. Okay. Which is or Pentecostal, Baptocostal, Baptocostal, Baptocostal. So he did not go to church with us. He did not like her flavor of church, right. and uh, but I was forced to go Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and um, but I actually learned more about the Bible and God from my dad just spending time with me as a kid. Uh, we rode dirt bikes. We went fishing. I just grew up doing stuff with him. You were definitely a daddy's girl. Yes. And so I had a wonderful father. I don't have daddy issues. Um, Lucky you. And so, but he does say, <laughs> well, around 12 or 13 years old, Satan entered me. Right. And, uh, and I turned into a very rebellious, very hateful, very mean-spirited person. Um, in his own words. Uh, Would but, that have been puberty? Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if that was puberty. I don't know. We're still waiting for him to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, during my high school years, I think I did, this is all back in Oklahoma, which is where I'm from. I did the regular dabbling with drugs and alcohol that all the high schools, kids that I ran around with did regular drinking, uh, smoking weed, but by my junior and senior year, it had progressed into liquid acid and crank, which was in the nineties, which is like a uh, old version of meth. meth. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, but I graduated top of my class, AP classes. I had three full ride scholarships offered to me 4.0. And yet I got crank meth in my backpack at high school. Right. You know, nobody knows. I weighed 82 pounds when I graduated high school because I really wasn't eating. And, um, 
I was so burnt out on the party scene because we had just partied every weekend and, and through the week for, for years. My high school boyfriend and I, we moved away. And we left all of those old friends and the drug friends behind. Um, I thought what would make me happy is to be a wife and a mom. I just really, I did not want to go to college, even though I had three full ride scholarships offered to me. I never went to college. I have no college degree. Um, we moved away, about an hour away, and within a year he was cheating on me and asked me to move out, and I was heartbroken. And so I moved back in with my parents, and then I bought a house, and then I met my first husband. And so he had a drug and alcohol problem, but it was just alcohol and weed, so it really wasn't on my radar that this is a, that big a deal. Right. It's just weed. It's just weed and alcohol. It's just, just beer. It's just beer. And, uh, Don't you love the it's just? It's just. It's just. And so his has never progressed past it's that. It's just a speedball. It's not a big deal. <laughs> Do you know what a speedball is? No. Okay. I didn't think you I'm did. just a drunk. <laughs> we'll, we'll give a tutorial after this is over. Yeah. I mean, okay. there's so many terms. So what happened after high school is for the next um, almost 13 years, I'm sober. Um, I am not doing drugs. I maybe drank a couple times on New Year's kind of thing. And... Instead of drinking and doing drugs, I was hyper obsessed with marrying a guy, buying a house and having children and doing all the X, Y, Z and getting my ducks in a row of what was going to make Heather happy. Right. I would get all of those things. I had the child. I bought the house. I made him marry me. I had another kid. Um, I wasn't happy. And so in my, my mind, the problem was actually him. He just wasn't good enough for me. He wasn't home enough. He didn't make enough money. He never had a stable job. So I created my own graphic design company so I could stay home and raise my kids and not have to put them in daycare um, so I could pay bills. I finally got sick of him, <laughs> I guess is a good way to word it, about seven years in, and I just said I want a divorce, move out. It was my home. And so he did not want the divorce. His family was United Pentecostal, and my family was Trinity Pentecostal, which is some differences, but what's similar. The, what's the main difference? I'm not going to get into that. We don't have enough. Time We're going to do a different podcast. podcast on that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we had this similar idea about a biblical marriage and all this. And, and I actually, in my crazy mind, I tried to hire the girl that worked at my tanning bed salon to go to his bar to get him to cheat on me so that I could divorce him. Crafty. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to pay her. Fr- it's Smart and beautiful. <laughs> it's frightening to me today. It's frightening. It should be. So anyways, I divorced this guy and, uh, you know, quickly remarried a new guy. Right. Uh, he was sober. He was in the military. He was stable. And we were best friends. Um, and he was a good guy. He was good to me. Um, and you're sober at this time. You're I'm not sober. Drinking. I'm not drinking or doing drugs at this time yet. And uh, so he deployed overseas right after we got married. And then when he came back, I don't know a delicate way to say this, but our sexual relations never resumed for the next three years. Right. <laughs> and I tried everything um, to pursue him or to initiate, and I got turned down at every road. And so I really thought the problem was me. My self-esteem was in the tank and in, in my because I didn't rely on God at that time in my life. I was a Christian. I had been, quote, air quote, saved, you know, when I was 13. But I wasn't living my life for God. Right. Uh, I was living my life for me. And so if a guy didn't want me, if, if my husband didn't value me or pursue me, I had no self-worth. And so for three years, this really messed with my mind. And then one night, I accidentally found an external hard drive that had some information on it that showed um, he just wasn't attracted to females. And so I accidentally found why this was happening. And around that same time, I'd say about a year before I found that information, I had started going to lots of psychiatrists, psychologists, doctors, because I was so depressed all the time. Um, I have been prescribed every antidepressant and mood stabilizer under the sun during my chunk of time that I was sober, and I never got well. I actually got crazier and more depressed and more discontented. And so the last thing that the doctor prescribed to me was Adderall for ADHD. And I can say that's the first thing I remember abusing, mm-hmm. meaning I just took more than prescribed because the dose didn't feel right. Right. Um, I had No one says, hey, I want to grow up and be a drug addict. No one says, I want to grow up and be an alcoholic, you know. And Aspirations. So I was just trying to get well. I was just trying to feel normal. Right. And uh, so around that same chunk of time, I had two surgeries back to back. One was a tumor that got removed, needed to get removed. But the other surgery was a lower back surgery. I talked to doctor into ablating some nerves across my lower back because I believed I lived in chronic pain for like 10 years. What do you think now? I was just spiritually sick and spiritual sickness manifests like looking like mental and physical 
issues. Now, some people yeah. really do have a chemical imbalance in the brain, and the medications for that may, work great for really that. some people may really have some right. nerve issue. But I did it. Yeah, but looking back, you know now that back, was not your case. It was not my case. I'm not saying it's not other people's cases. Right. I'm speaking for myself. Um, that my spiritual sickness was manifesting in a whole lot of mental and physical ways in my life. And uh, so I got prescribed opiates. And so I was abusing opiates for about a year up until the failure of that second marriage. And my dad, who's Southern Baptist, absolutely hates alcohol. And, and so I wasn't really drinking, but I was doing a lot of pills for about a year. And so I go to an addiction doctor to try to get off pills, and he puts me on Suboxone. We could talk another hour about that. I have... N- Suboxone Nothing nice is, to say about that. Suboxone is synthetic heroin. It's and the government's way to wean you off of an opiate. The problem is that it, it's more addictive than the opiate. It's more addictive. Right. So, so you just trade sub- one problem for another. Suboxone led Correct. me to heroin. Right. I was not a heroin addict before Suboxone. Right. Um, and so I took the Suboxone as prescribed. And when it came to the six-month period, like he weaned me off of it. But I was so sick, I started drinking. And I remember my dad looking at me and saying, like, if this is what you're like, you know, seeing me with alcohol, he goes, go back to pills. Ah. And I was mm. like... That's great advice. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. I got that signed off. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay, so thanks, Dad. All of those emotional and mental things were going on at the same time as marriage number two falling apart, and I found out the information I found out. Right. And so I, I am not a drug addict or an alcoholic because of two failed marriages or because my dad's Baptist or any of that. Right. Like, I used this catalyst in my life, and I was maladjusted. I did not know how to deal with life. I had and less Pentecostal. Re- and <laughs> had less resiliency than I should have. Sorry, right? if there's anybody out there Pentecostal. Will you just stop being offensive? For like That's five what I'm saying. Minutes? I wasn't trying Can to offend. You? I just like to make fun of you. So, um, which I love about you. Yeah. Here's the deal. I left husband number two and I wrote off my parents. I gave my kids to their dad and I, within five days, I'm an IV meth and heroin addict. I'm just around the wrong crowd at the wrong time. And which I want to call out was... A, a bit of clarity on your part. So you had custody of your kids. Yeah. The ex didn't have a job, wasn't productive, wasn't doing anything. Baby daddy, right? Number one. And you had that moment of clarity, like I'm about to go down a road where I don't need my kids. Like I can't do this to yeah. them. I called him and I said, Hey, will you take them? And he was like, yeah, because in his mind, no child support. He right, exactly. <laughs> and uh, so he, him, him and his mom raised them for the next seven and a half years. I had no idea I wasn't going to see my kids for seven years. Because um, you thought this was just like, take a I, need a, I need a minute, I need, I need a, a break. break, I need to divorce this yeah. guy. I need, to get, I need to get my stuff straight. Yep. Mm-hmm. Seven mm-hmm. years but, later. But my right. stuff didn't go straight for a long time. <laughs> my stuff went cattywampus for about seven years. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm really grateful that my children were not with me yeah, during those absolutely. years. Yeah, and I'm really grateful that they were safe with uh, their dad's their dad's mom. They were really safe with grandma. Grandma yeah. was really the one that took grandma care and grandpa, of them. Grandma uh, and yeah. grandpa, his parents raised them, and um, and so I just went on the craziest lifestyle you can imagine for the next five years or so. And I won't get into very many details on that unless you want to ask. But I'm I'm basically a, convicted of seven felonies. I have no idea how many misdemeanors I'm convicted of. Uh, I'm I'm real street stupid. Like, I don't understand that hustle and that game of what people will do to people. Right. Um, the reason I said go wherever you need to go is because when we get into this later, I want people to see how low you can sink as a human being and how much power God has to pull you out so of So I'll it. say two things. Like, um, I, because I didn't understand that world, I grew up in church. I was taking my kids to church. I was a PTA mom. Like, right. I had no idea. I had friends, air quote friends, that sold me to someone else for a shot of dope. Right. You know, and then I'm stuck with some guy that just got out of prison for 36 hours on the north side of Oklahoma City. I got to figure out how to get away. Mm-hmm. And so stuff like that happened a lot. Um, I was with guys that were very abusive to me. Um, I've been raped a couple times, but one of the most low moments that I can remember is when the, the, the court date of losing custody of my kids came. And I wasn't trying to get them, but I still wanted to like show up at court because I would like visitation of some sort, which right. wasn't allowed. And uh, I knew that they were probably going to ask me to... Uh, take a drug test right in my mind I'm like I know this is coming and so I remember telling myself you know I'll stop doing drugs seven days before the court date and I'll get it out of my system so that I can do a UA but the seventh day would come and I would still get loaded and and I'd say okay six days yeah but then the sixth day would come and five days I'd get five and then four and then three and Uh oh court's here I couldn't do it you know and so my dad picked me up from a trap house to take me to court. What's a trap house? It's a house where people live that do drugs together for the mm-hmm. most part. It's not like a family home. Um, so my dad picks me up from this trap house I was staying at, 
uh, takes me to the courthouse. He parks his truck in the courthouse parking garage, and I have to ask him to get out of the car so I can do a shot of dope before I go in to lose my kids. How hard was that? It, it's You're crazy in the moment because you think you need it to deal with what you're about to have to go deal with. Yeah. Um, but I'm only having to deal with it because of the thing I continue to do. Right. And so, so many people... Pu- falsely think or ignorantly think that addiction is a choice. Um, it, the illness of addiction is progressive in nature. And so if you don't get to the last stage of addiction, and that it is a choice. But when you get to the last stage, there, you no longer have a choice. I didn't have a choice about getting wrapped, loaded or you're not. You're wrapped up in it. It controls me. It's a me. must. Yeah, it's you a have must. to. Yeah. Your I can't even walk into court if I don't, if I don't, if I don't take this and function some, right. some, some, some type of way. They, we mm-hmm. call it the insanity. Like the, I just don't have a defense, a mental defense to say no to it 100% of the time. I, I do it again anyways. And I don't understand why. And I don't want to. And so I had that experience and I lose custody of my kids. Um, and then I thought, well, okay, Oklahoma is the problem. I just got to get out of Oklahoma. So me and this boyfriend, we moved to Kansas. Well, there's drugs in Kansas, you know? And so I had that experience. So then we come back to Oklahoma. And so I started going to jail a lot. They would keep me two weeks to four months at a time. And then I started going to detoxes a lot. I went to a detox three times in Oklahoma, a seven-day detox. And so what my experience was showing me is that I would have every intention of staying sober. I meant it with every fiber of my being. But you give me 12 to 24 hours once I exit jail or rehab, and I'm loaded again. Right. And I don't understand why this is happening. And so when I went to, and, and I would get it out of my system. If, if you go to jail for four months, uh, rarely do you get it loaded in right. jail. I mean, you can get stuff in jail, but not every day to like yeah. stay high or anything. But it's I would, not your normal. I would be completely sober leaving these places. And, well, and, and, and the I'm reason still, you're saying that is because when you're coming off of heroin, you're coming off of You think opiates, if you just get past the sickness, you'll be fine. The, the hardcore piece is the dope sick, right. right? It's that however long after the last time you've taken it. Because it does feel like you're dying. It oh, feels like have, every bone in your body is breaking. Yeah, liquid out of every orifice. Yeah. It's like so clearly if you can make it, make, it, make it past that, you'll be fine. That's, that's what the you thought. think. That's the thought. And yeah. then my experience was showing me that's not true. Right. Yeah. Because you were I've coming out completely, completely sober, through all that. And then I do it again. And going right back to it. Yeah. And so the third detox, I was crying, begging them to send me somewhere longer. And so that detox ran my insurance, put me on a plane, and sent me to Texas for my first 30-day rehab. Um, And so that's how I end up in Texas. And I go to this amazing treatment center in the Hill Country near Kerrville, Texas. And I learn a lot of information from other people in recovery that work there and are teaching classes there. And they finally explained what we call the cycle of addiction from the doctor's opinion of our literature on having no choice, which is what I was experiencing. I didn't seem to have a choice. Why do I keep going back to it? And also not having control of the amount once you once you put it in your body. And they they explain these two symptoms. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's what's wrong with me. No one has ever explained this to me before. I just thought if I had a better moral compass or if I had more faith or said the right prayers or left the right guy, like I would finally be sober. Mm -hmm. And they're explaining the illness and it made sense. And so I left there and went to sober living, um, but quickly got a guy before I got God and I lied on the step work. Um, and so that guaranteed a big relapse. That's what that all, you don't get away with it. You don't get to be connected to God and dishonest. So I relapse again for another 10 months in Kerrville. And now I'm in Texas, not sober. So that's uh, the Texas Hill Country. Yeah. Right. And, and so my last little spree, I'll speed it up, is that I was living in a storage unit by myself in August in Kerrville, Texas. And I called a friend to go back to rehab for the fifth time. And he worked it out. He said, you can come. Go right now. But it took me another two days of doing my drugs and drinking to get mentally ready to finish <laughs> I got, everything. I got to get, I got to get everything wrapped up in my head, right? <laughs> yeah. Before I go let it all out again. Yeah. And that's every one of us, Everyone. unfortunately. Right. Yeah. And so um, because of the way, because insurance companies really control t- treatment. I work in treatment too. And so I'm at liberty to complain about the treatment industry. Um, and so he told me, they're not going to take you for heroin again, but they'll take you for alcohol. Can you show up drunk? Well, yeah. Done. She said, sign me on the dotted line. <laughs> so took, How much do you want me to take? So I took all my heroin, all my benzos, all my drugs. And wait, you made it there? And alive. drank a bottle of Crown on the way there. Crown apple. Crown is apple. Right? I don't yeah. recommend that. You did it that. right. Uh, and so I don't remember my first three days there. Um, <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, <laughs> it just seems so simple. But so that was Weird. August 26th of 2016, and that's my sobriety date. I have not taken a drink or a drug of any sort since then. And, um, you just celebrated seven I years. I just celebrated seven years wow. a couple weekends ago. Congratulations. And what's crazy is it's all God. I'm just an idiot that knows how to burn my life to the ground. 
Yeah. I'm being and you're honest. Good at it. I'm so good at it. You really are. It's my specialty. Yeah. yeah. Seven and, felonies. Um, <laughs> criminal. Oh, seven felonies, seven. Yeah, I see a seven thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so it's 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 insane. Um, but the difference was because people will say oh, you gotta hit rock bottom, you know, and that's ignorant. There is no rock bottom. For some people it's death. There is no external thing that's going to convince you to get sober. I had way worse external things happen to me the years before I finally got sober. And so what really happened is I was finally out of ideas of how I was going to get well. I finally understood I don't know anything about recovery. I, I, I get that y'all are talking about working these steps to get connected to God, but I'm super self-righteous that was raised in the church, so I think I'm already connected to God. I got saved when I was 13. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You already know? have the key to the door. I'm already in. Yeah. And uh, secured and, my spot. Yeah. And so that's <laughs> one thing that I've always noticed about church recovery programs is they get it wrong in this sense. They think if you just got saved, somehow then you won't have the addiction issues because God will make you a new creature. And right. by the way, and for some people, for some that people, works. yes, but right. this for is not people. always. But that, it's, this is not a, a one size fits all no. situation. So what I'm saying no. is recovery is more of the sanctification side of it, where God is molding me and changing me into a different right. person here while through action, through action on the, on, while right. I'm here, right? right? And and obviously salvation is faith based, not deed based. And mm-hmm. so there's nothing I can do to earn my salvation. I just accept it. Well, that's the only part I had ever done right. was accept that. And I had never went through the soul changing process of sanctification. Um, I thought, okay, one and done, I'm saved. I'm good. And so I already know God. And so I was finally out of ideas. I was not excited about being in a 12 step fellowship because it seemed so secular that I didn't agree with their language, but I was finally broken enough to just say, tell me what to do. And so they sent a new lady up to that rehab. She, they said, she's going to work the steps with you. Just do everything she says. And I did. Um, and I worked uh, a 12-step fellowship. And I worked all 12 steps within like seven or eight weeks. Um, I started sponsoring other women by the time I was two months sober. Um, and it radically changed me from the inside out. I got a connection with God, which is Jesus to me, on such a more profound level than I ever got from all my years in church or reading right. the Bible with my dad because it became particular and real to me based on my defects of character or ways that I am selfish. Um, I had to face those things. I had to look at the fact that I tend to blame others or have a victim mentality or I'm a hypocrite or I judge people. All of this stuff that separates me from God that I had no clue was separating me from God. And so the 12 steps gave me a path of just surrendering those to God, to begging him to help me be a different person because I realized I can't even be a good, decent person, much less a good wife or a good mom without his help. But I'm patiently waiting. (laughs) You're patiently waiting. Yeah, I'm patiently waiting for her to become just you know a good person. Uh-huh. Right, uh-huh. Be- because you're 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 the prince. That well, I'm, I'm up right. on the spiritual hilltop trying to coax her. Yeah, up. well, let's wait till yeah. we get to when we met, and then, then they'll be the judge of that. <laughs> oh, we'll let the listeners decide. <laughs> so that's how I ended up getting sober, and so I spent three years in Kerrville, um, but the second eighteen months was sober. And um, it radically changed my life. I found some spiritual disciplines and some spiritual practices within the 12-step community that I adopted completely and still do to this day, and it continues to work. And so not only... In fact, the primary of our life is the 12-step program right. because that's where God outfit us with the weapons to help people. people. Like right. We're very involved, as you know, in our church, and we're very... but. But more so in the 12-step side, because right. I feel like that's my purpose and calling. That's why God got me sober. He outfit us in um, a special way. And so way. he equipped me to be uniquely useful to talk to another drug addict or another alcoholic, because I've sat where they sat, and I know exactly what it feels like, and I know how frustrating and hopeless it feels, and I do know the way out, if they're willing to accept that type of help. Not right. everybody is. Um, and so uh, I'm just blown away. At not not only am I seven years sober, that's cool and that's a miracle on its own, um, but I'm also comfortable in my own skin and I don't deal with any of those physical pain or mental issues that I thought I did all those 10 years before drugs when I was going to every psychiatrist and having the back surgery. Like all of it's gone. And she's right. nice to me most of the time. Most well, of I mean, the time. That, that might, you might, she might be nice more time if, if you work on you a little bit. I can't. I can't do it. <laughs> so let's get into you then. Let's yeah, talk so about let's hear you. Give us, give us your... So while she's got this going on, you two at this point... We don't know each other. You don't know each other. Our, our paths haven't crossed. So where are you out there? But there's a really w- weird story that we will not have time to get into today. We'll have to tell you after the podcast all of the things that were involved Intersecting in us, us meeting. meeting. It's, it's really weird. It, there's no way around it, but God, there's not, you can't even put this many coincidences together. But, um, so I was raised here in Houston on the West side. 
Don't do it. West side. <laughs> he did it. He did it. Uh, on the west the side main suburbs. Streets of Katy. Yeah, the main the streets main of Katy. The main streets of Katy. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> they are mean. It's all concrete there. It's yeah. very mean. Thug life, K Town. Um, we always make that joke because of the way I was a teenager. But um, so my parents divorced when I was twelve. But I always talk about this because I was being formed. Like, my behavior is being formed before my parents ever divorced. I think a lot of people look back and they go, well, my parents were divorced, and this happened, and this happened. But if I go beyond 12, if I go back, I never felt okay in my own skin. Mm -hmm. I never felt like I belonged. I never felt content. I lived a life of discontent, if only, if only, if only. It was always if only. If I can just get, if I can just have, if I can... Way before my parents divorced. Um... Our household before they divorced was, you know, erratic. My dad was a workaholic, and when he was home, they would fight. And, you know, it was unfortunately probably an average American household by today's standards. So they divorced when I was 12. I went and lived with my dad for about a year. He, he um, rented a house in the next neighborhood over so he could be close to us. I lived with him for about a year, but there was a problem there. So my mom... By this point at 12, she was she had already become like baby, basically a prescription drug addict already. She was part of the OxyContin revolution. She was on antidepressants. She was, and she didn't have a ton of money. My dad paid her a healthy amount for child support. Because it was three boys. Three boys, and mm -hmm. he made good money. And we're talking like, we're talking the 80s. Yeah, when money was different. Mm hmm. She was, he was paying her like 2500 bucks a month oh, God in the Lord. 80s. Like she, you were rich. She legit didn't have to work. She probably could have. I mean, the house note, I think, was 400 and something bucks at the right. time. So I went and lived with him for a year, and I didn't like it because he had rules. <laughs> oh. He had accountability. Mm. I, had to, I had to go to school and do chores and all that, and I'm like, ugh. So I went back to live with her. I went back to poor town mm -hmm. uh, to live basically as a free-range chicken off the rails doing what I wanted to do. So it was... I'm the oldest of three brothers. Now, fast forward many years, I've actually got an older sister who was given up for adoption, Mandy, who I'm very close with. And when my dad remarried, I have a youngest sister who is 30. I'm 51. She's 30. But growing up, there was three of us. It was me, my younger brother, Scott, youngest brother, Eric. And we were unsupervised. Like I tell Heather today, like you can't leave me unsupervised. <laughs> Even today, I can see this. It's just not a good thing. Yeah, I worked. At, I worked with you at a door in a concert. I know what you can be you like. You can't if you're leave him alone. No, he's got. I, I got like three sixty on him. Like yeah, yeah got it. she's tracking you, buddy. Oh, she has to. She have an air tag on you. <laughs> it's in his wallet. He doesn't even know. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so. We had we didn't have the parental supervision. We didn't have these things. And I got into I started drinking around thirteen. And and back then, I don't know. I wanna say I was mature, but I wasn't. I you came weren't. across as mature, but I definitely wasn't. You thought you were mature. <clears throat> I thought I was. And and my mom didn't say anything. We would go camping with this other family all the time. Like literally, like once or twice a month, we'd go out to New Braunfels, go tubing, and and we would drink. And I really liked it because all of that stuff that I was filled with, um, no validation, no self-esteem, no contentment, no anything, when I would drink, all that would wash away. As soon as that buzz started to hit, I was finally right with the world. Right. Right. And I can't say in that moment I became an alcoholic, but what I can tell you is that I did not drink correctly from the get-go. Mm -hmm. Like from the beginning, I drank too much. I, I had no meter. It wasn't like, I'm going to have a, a beer. Right. It was like, I'm going to have the whole case, mm -hmm. your case, right. their case, and who has the crown vodka and tequila. Right. Like if you have a scale of like zero to 100, I had friends that could go up 20 30% on that scale, get a good buzz, and they just go that way the whole day. They were good. I overshot that scale and went to 100 every time I drank mm -hmm. by late late teens, early 20s. Yeah. <clears throat> but at that time, I could pause it. I could pause the drinking. Mm -hmm. So around 13, 14, I start drinking. Uh, 14, 15, I start smoking weed. And I mean, 
I'm finding like relief in this. It's, mm-hmm. it's almost medicating me. Because like they're I'm, looking forward to these moments. Yeah, because it's peace. Right. Right. It's escape. It's, You're escaping. That's what so many people don't realize. When I found opiates, it, it made me feel comfortable in my own skin for mm-hmm. the first time ever. And I had wished that the antidepressants had done that it's, effect. It, I finally it's actually felt a normal. Solution. It's a solution to being sober. No, it's right. counterfeit. Yes. Right. It's yeah. counterfeit, but it's a momentary solution. But okay. in that moment, it's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So by 15 and a half, my dad had good, um, good insurance. So by 15 and a half, um, my mom took me to a therapist. I was a bad kid and the therapist <laughs> was recruiting for a rehab. We didn't know this. This is back during the rehab boom in 86, 87. And I got put in rehab now for weed. I was not. She loves to point that out. <laughs> weed. That's the, not even weed. real. That's the, not the, even the, real. The criminal <laughs> loves Heather's to like, point that out. Heather's like, dude, did you hear my story? <laughs> right. You went for what? Right. He right. went to rehab for a year for weed. So that's the thing is that 15 and a half, 1986, 87, um, like I said, my dad got good insurance. There was no regulation at the time. Yeah. Rehab was in a boom. I went into Spring Shadows Glen in Houston, Texas for one full year, 365 days. But amazingly, you were cured. When Blue Cross Blue Shield said, We're not paying anymore, I was cured and they let me out. So I was in there for a year. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. I was in there for a year. and But, but you the, loved it. Tell them I that. I loved it. <laughs> here's why. Here's why. For the first time, it was all about me. This is all I'd been waiting for. I just really <laughs> wanted it to be all about me. And it, you were getting complete attention. Oh. Let's fix you. And. Because I want to be validated by human beings, I want to be loved by people, I want to be recognized by people. It was like, do you remember the movie The Breakfast Club? Yes. That was rehab. Mm -hmm. You had the skater, the jock, the... Emo girl. The emo... You had all of them, (laughs) and when I would hang out, I could become any one of them. If I hung out with the emo dude, his name was Derek. I still remember him. He drove a Fiero. Do you remember that? I had a Fiero. It was my first car. <laughs> I he did. He had a Fiero. He always wore black. His hair would come across his face. He had the you know flat brim hat. You know. But I remember all of these people that I could just melt right in with each one of them. So I go through that year, and it was all about me. It's all about Donnie. How do you feel today? Hey, listen. Um, <laughs> how did that make you feel? Tell us, uh, tell us, tell us your feeling share today. Yeah, let it out. <laughs> um, and, but here's the thing is that I remember I had a counselor named Danny, and Danny was so frustrated with me. I remember we had a, a I call it men's group. It was a boys group, but it was all the boys in a circle. And he said, tell me the one thing you don't want to tell anyone. <laughs> now, let's remind ourselves that I'm from the west side, very middle class suburbs of Houston. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bad behaving kid, but I'm not a bad kid. And so when he went around the room, I went, I got in a fight with somebody and I stabbed him and I don't know if they lived. Which, which is a lie. It was a complete fabrication. And Danny knew it. He wasn't yeah. stupid. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He knew it. I didn't have the ability to be honest. It was not an ability of mine. I just didn't. I didn't want you to know who I was. So whoever you are, I would just become right. like you. Well, this went on until I was 41 years old. So I get, I, I stay a full year in rehab. I get a one-year chip from our 12-step fellowship. Because mm-hmm. you did a year. None of it made sense to me. None of it mattered to me. I didn't care about it. Like today... Um, our sobriety birthdays mean more than our belly button birthday. We don't care about our belly button birthday. We care about our rebirth, right? right? That's what means something to us. But I remember coming out of rehab. I was drinking in two weeks. Mm -hmm. And and it's not even like I'm an alcoholic and I'm drinking because I have to. It's like, it just didn't phase me. It was more like a year long vacation to Mm -hmm. me. I was going to say, it was like you went and hung out with a bunch of people for a year Mm -hmm. and it, it gave you a safe place to be. Everybody made it about you. I mean, you had a solid vacation on Blue Cross Blue Shield. Sweet. It was sweet. Hence the regulations today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now you get 30, 45, maybe, maybe 60 days. But yeah. Um, and you're not going in for just weed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I go off. Uh, I get out. I try to go back to school. I get kicked out of school. I Weren't can't you asked f- to leave facing yeah. prosecution? Yeah. So I get asked to... <laughs> they didn't like you a lot at all. <laughs> but here, here's the thing that I want people to understand. And this is not a prideful thing. This is a... And opposites. I couldn't finish school. I couldn't sit still. I couldn't do anything. But I wasn't dumb. Right. 
at 17 years old, I quit in the, t- I only made it to the 10th grade. I had failed sixth. I had failed ninth. I had just kept failing. When people are like, hey, when did you graduate? I can't tell you because I don't even know what year I was supposed to. I think around 89 or 90. I don't know. Right. I left school in February of that year. And by June, my mom is like, get a GED or get out. So out of spite, I go take the GED test. I tank math. By the way, I've never passed a math class Math class in my entire life but I scored in the top 99th percentile of graduating seniors in um, literature English like so I wasn't dumb no you just had untreated alcoholism but didn't know it but didn't know it just right. like those 10 years sober for me so I go off on a job hunt I'm 17 and I'm getting a new job every six months I have done everything I have Tinted windows in cars, tinted windows in houses. I've worked on cars. I've built fences. You were a fences. lifeguard. I was, I've no, done. No, I don't believe that. He and I both were lifeguards okay. in, our, in our. A lifeguard. Yeah. I was a lifeguard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he saved a guy's life. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. Well, I shouldn't be laughing then. <laughs> Thank you, Donnie, for your service. Well, not in lifeguarding, though. I saved a guy's life. I used to, another six-month job, I worked at the Great Southwest Equestrian Center in Katy, and a guy that was riding his horse had a heart attack, and I did CPR on him and saved him. So did you roll through jobs because of just never being satisfied? Correct. It was just always like, okay, well, that was fun. What's next? Always looking for the next thing. Yeah. Nothing was good enough. I'm seeking contentment. I'm seeking peace, and I can't find it. Yeah. And you'll see the correlation. He did that with jobs, but he also does it with wives. What? What? No. But you found the great one now. Um, <laughs> thank goodness that. Thank goodness that has been broken. We're the so Lord thankful. found me a woman to fix. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I'll speed it up a little. So uh, I get married the first time at 20. We get married in a church. It was a non-denominational church. Um, I was in and out of the whole God idea. And she was, out. <laughs> she was heavy. Like at that time, so her family was pretty rough. Like pretty rough. There was some molestation going on. There was some, like she had a rough life. And she had found this couple who were very Christian, very loving to kind of take her in and mentor her. She still lived at home, but they really were a big influence in her life. But it was that kind of church where um, women wear the dress from top to ankle, right? no instruments. Like it was one of those mm-hmm. real hardcore churches. Anyway, so I removed that from her, right? Because I'm a drunken pot smoking idiot, right? So right. And an atheist, kind of. And so we get married in a Baptist, not a Baptist church, but in a church I was kind of open to it, but it was very rocky soil. And within a year, I'm like, forget that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, over that. And then she began to hit me. So in that marriage, that marriage only lasted five years. She was not, I don't want to say this in an ugly way, and I don't mean it ugly. She was not quick-witted and intelligent. Like I have a very sharp tongue, and I think quickly, like Heather does too. And I think that's why we're able to go back and forth so well. Right. And so she would be mad at me about something and I would lawyer argue her and she'd get mad and punch me in the face. Right. And this girl had a left. I mean, it <laughs> So what you're saying me. is she beat you up. Yeah. Okay. So you would yeah. beat her up with your words and she'd beat you up with her fist. Yes. Okay, got and it. by five years I had had enough. I just couldn't do it anymore. Now that by is no way meaning like our marriage is over because of her. I had no ability to show up in a relationship. Right. Zero. You were, it was about you, your brokenness, not hers. Correct. Yeah. Correct. I had no ability to show up as a partner, as a husband, as I was selfish, inconsiderate, dishonest, all of it. Right. So the ending of our marriage was a two way street for the both of us. My reason to leave was that I really did get tired of being punched in the face. Right. So I left that marriage. I go uh, into an apartment into Houston, Galleria area, party time. And I went off the rails. And I mean off the rails for two years. Because you weren't being supervised again. There was no female to put the reins on and supervise <laughs> me. That's the truth. Yeah. Right. That is the truth. And um, my youngest brother moved in with me. And... I don't think we were in the apartment before 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning, seven nights a week for two years, unless we were bringing the party back. Yeah. Continue at the house. That was when I found cocaine. 
Yeah. Um, and what I found was that prior to cocaine, when you drink too much too quickly, you do what I like to call time travel. And I was a time traveler and it was becoming <laughs> more and more. And here's what that looks like. You get off work at five o'clock, you stop by a convenience store, you grab a 40, you pound it on your 15 minute drive home, you walk in, you pour yourself a big tumbler of alcohol, you drink so much that by 9 p.m. you are so drunk that you leave your body, mm-hmm. but your body keeps partying. <laughs> On its own. And then you wake up at 6 a.m. as if you time traveled from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. Right. And you go, where have I been? Well, what have I done? Yeah. And, you car? Immediately and where's like, my car and my keys? You look to see who's in the apartment. You go look for your car. You check it to see if there's any like, because we used to have what's called bar cars. You had a bar car. You had a beat up car that you would take to the bar because you didn't know how it was going to get home, if it was going to get home. Right. What condition, right? That was two years. And then I met a new warden. I needed a warden. I needed somebody to watch over me and take care of me. And tell you, no, don't do that. And I met hostage number two. Right. Um, By this point in time, I am so separated from God. I am so atheist. I am an intellectual, prideful intellectual that science is right. You can't tell you nothing. Nothing. And I am getting to a point where when people bring up Christianity, God, Jesus, I'm like, oh, let's go. Let's do some verbal sparring. I want to argue this out. So it became like entertainment for you. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And that was the way I lived until I was 45 years old. So um, marriage number two, um, again, I had no idea how to show up as a husband, a partner, a friend. I was inconsiderate. I was selfish. I was dishonest. I cheated on her. But we were married 18 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now, I didn't cheat on her right away, right? I waited eight or nine years to do so. That was very kind of you. Right? Mm. Yeah. But I cheated Gracious. on her. Um, my drinking progressed. I didn't go to college. I got a GED, but I got into a technical field where I began to make money fairly quickly. When I was 20, 25 years old, I was making fifty to $70,000 a year already. Um, I was in an hourly wage where I could work as many hours as I wanted. I was making bank, which meant I could buy all the alcohol and drugs I needed. Yeah. I never did without till the day I quit. Um, was she involved with those things too? Were you both drinking? No, she was a normie. She had what we call a normie. normie. (laughs) She had, she in fact did not try marijuana until I pushed her enough until she did. She had never done a drug. All she had done is drank. And she knew how to drink. She had the ability to control the amount, stop when she wanted, drink when, you know what I mean? She just so had, she was more of a, health, had a more healthy personality she, in that sense. She just doesn't have the illness that we right. have. She had she a healthy relationship with alcohol, mm-hmm. right? She right. could take it or leave it alone. It didn't matter to her. Right. Um, she cooked for me. She cleaned for me. And so I used her. Right. I look back now. I didn't know that at the time. Right. It wasn't malicious. It wasn't like I need this woman to come into my life and take care of me because I can't do it. I mean, this is just what happened. Yeah. Um, and she loved me. And I loved her to the extent and ability that I had, which wasn't much. Right. I was just so selfish, so self-centered, all of it. But you don't really know that until you're no. on the other side of it. Correct. You have no clue. When you're in so- when you're in it, because I mean, very similar to you guys. Uh, I'm on number five. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you, when you look back, when you have a clear mind and you're walking differently mm-hmm. and, and you're in relationship with Christ and he's kind of helped you through with your, your own bumps and bruises and you start taking responsibility mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for your part and all of that, mm-hmm. you look back and go, oh, mm-hmm. like I really thought in that moment that was right. I really thought that I was thinking like where you were saying some of the things in your head, I always would say, I outgrew them. Mm-hmm. I just outgrew them. Mm-hmm. We don't have anything in common anymore. You're, you're not, you're not like me. Yeah. When really it was just, I'm not happy. This didn't work. Well, who's next? I was so spiritually right. sick. Right. I can look yeah. back and I can see that I self-willed each marriage. I self-willed the children. I self-willed the home. Like I just thought this will make me happy. And when you couldn't make me happy, you were expendable. And mm-hmm. you were the problem, not me. Right. It, it was a, it's a sales relationship. Mm-hmm. You're Transactional. Right. Your, your, your partner was like a salesperson. As long as they're selling you what you want, they're good. As long but as, as they gave they me don't. the right kind of attention or the right kind of security. Yeah. When they didn't, you were not. Yeah. But that minute, cause like, I know for me personally, it, it's, 
I told Jeremy, Jeremy probably said the same thing you did. It's a little scary. There's this cutoff that happens, and it's mm-hmm. like, never knew you, didn't care. Oh, done, done. next, done. Bye. bye. Like, I don't think move back on. about you. I don't have your feelings about you. Mm-hmm. Right. But I got to go. It's time to move on. And so there's New a, shiny toy. And I have that ability. There's a part a, in our literature that talks about us not having the ability to form true partnerships with other people. We use them, and we're not even aware of that. Right. We either dominate them dominate or we try them and juice them for all the validation and esteem that we can get. Right. Yeah. Okay. And then I have a, I have a spin as a fixer, so I would get into it, realize, oh Jesus, and then like, but I can fix it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can fix it. Mm-hmm. I can fix you. I can fix you. I have like these powers. <laughs> That's what I thought when yeah, I met no. Heather. I was trying to fix her, but I've just kind of <laughs> given up. I resigned. You gave it up. Yeah. Turned in okay, so uh, let me fast forward it because I'm looking at our time. So I think we should just do another episode and keep going. We're gonna have okay. to. Yeah. So so I tell you what, let's do this. So you finish your story. Yeah. Get sober finally. Yeah. Please. Let's. Can we get you sober <laughs> yeah. and get rid of your warden? You know what? And by then, the way, everybody was saying that. Can we get, get him sober? Get <laughs> sober. And can we just get? I want to show. Oh, can I have a shirt that says that? <laughs> just get, just get Donnie sober. <laughs> <laughs> I need a shirt. So we'll get you sober. We'll get your warden out of the picture, and then we'll wrap it up and we'll come back and pick up where we got together. Where you get together. So we'll do two episodes. Yes. Let's do two. I like it because we, like ha- we got, got enough, a lot of things. Because yeah. we're God's done with pretty us. broken. I don't yeah. know if you've picked that up yet. Really not. I, yeah. I mean, it feels a little normal to me. <laughs> <laughs> what does that say about me? <laughs> that we've found a true kinship. Yeah, and friendship. Yes, we yeah. must be related somewhere. So okay. So then I'll I'll semi speed it up. So semi semi. Yeah. No, we still want you to speed it up. I I began cheating around eight or nine years because. Um, and it had nothing to do with her. It was completely my emptiness. I'm just seeking. I just want validation. I want esteem. I want to feel attractive. I want, 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 want. And you're still drinking then. I am drinking, and I'm blaming her. We have a sexless marriage. This is her fault. Right. I was contributing nothing. Mm-hmm. I was contributing nothing. I wasn't being romantic. But you thought she owed it to you. Correct. I wasn't offering intimacy. And I mean like true, like emotional intimacy. Right. None of that. I wanted yeah. just the physical, when I wanted it, how I wanted it. She doesn't give it to me. Cool. I'll go somewhere else. Yeah. I'll get it from somebody else. Transactional. Because it wasn't emotional for you. It was no. all physical. A hundred percent. Yeah. Show me the attention. Yep. Let me feel good. Mm-hmm. Yep. But don't ask me to give you anything in yeah. return. One hundred percent. Yeah. Um, and so I did not... Um, it all started to come crashing down when I was 38 years old. I'll, I'll you let, had a good run. I'll let you interject. She loves to interject on this story. I don't know. So I was 38 years old. I am, mm. I don't know, 18, 19 years into an IT career, right? That I can lose. That I can lose with oh. some buffoonery. <laughs> I was like, what story are you doing? Uh-huh. It's the buffoonery story. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and uh, keep in mind, I'm married and I am on my way home from the House of Blues with a woman from work who is not my wife. And we get pulled over. Now, I had been drinking heavy. She had been drinking heavy. And I got arrested for because the cops, we pulled into a parking lot and she opened her door to throw up. <laughs> Right. Well, that's a sign right there. <laughs> and HPD just happened to be sitting literally with an eye shot, saw her do this, immediately pulled me over, and I got arrested for possession and uh, unlawful carry of a firearm. It was just weed, bro. <laughs> this does not count. You had a uh, concealed carry <laughs> and weed. <laughs> Oh my God! <laughs> so, so I'm I'm now the hardened criminal that I thought I was as a teenager. So you have made your dreams come true. Yes, <laughs> there I'm you now go. I'm now. With your weed. <laughs> but I'm a better criminal than her because I still don't have a felony. But right. I well, had if you're money. Not, she's doing it right. I had I had money to pay good lawyers. But anyways, yes, I got arrested for possession of. And you're with a woman weed. that's not your wife and Correct. works with you at your job. And so I got arrested and I got put in jail. They lost me. So HPD books me in. I go into county. They lose me. I'm there for a week. I was supposed to be there overnight. Nobody's heard from me. Nobody knows what happened to me. Nobody cared. That's probably the truth. They probably had a sigh of relief. <laughs> Donnie's gone somewhere for a week. <laughs> he took a vacation. But, but here's what happened is that I did pay a good lawyer. She did a good job. I wanted to fight this. I didn't do anything wrong. My driving didn't get me pulled over. They saw that woman throw up. And so here's what I wanted to rest on. I wanted to rest my case on the fact that they said it was my license plate light, but the truck was like one month old. Don't lie. Mm-hmm. They said that the the weed was in plain view. 
You had to tear my truck apart. Don't lie. Right. And I wanted to rest on that. Well, it couldn't be about time. you. It right. couldn't be about Correct. you. Yeah. It couldn't be about you. He's a victim. Yeah. yeah you, it wasn't yeah. until I was like a year and a half sober that I finally was able to go, you know what? Had I not had drugs in the car, <laughs> you know what would have happened? They would have actually tested me DWI and I would have gotten that. And it's way worse. Yeah. Right. For a long time, I was a victim of HPD. But the truth of the matter is, had the drugs not been in the car, I would have gotten a DWI, which is way worse than right. possession I love that you of. Call it a DWI. <laughs> DWI. Yeah, a DWI, DWI. <laughs> which is way. Listen, a DWI is way worse oh, than the possession of the small amount of weed that I had. So, right. believe it or not, I actually got off light. It was a wonderful scenario. That that's really what was. you got arrested for. Um, God's grace. Oh, I'm telling you. Oh, he has saved me e- so many even times. Even in the middle of a mm-hmm. icky, sticky situation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so what happened is I go on probation for a year. Well, I can't do drugs because I have to go see a probation officer and I have to pee in a cup. And that means I can't do drugs. I stay in your system. So now my drinking hits a whole new level. For almost a year straight, every single night on my way home, I would grab an 18 pack of Corona and drink the entire 18 pack when I got home. And then sometimes you'd have to throw liquor on top of that if it didn't do the job. Oh, 18 just wouldn't cut it. In the end of my drinking, I was... It doesn't work anymore yeah. right? when you yeah. get to that point. In the end of my drinking, I was drinking a handle. What is it? A half gallon mm-hmm. of Crown Royal in... A lot of people don't know what a handle is. It's when the bottle of liquor is so big, it, there's a handle literally on <laughs> yeah, the you bottle. Had, yeah, you have mm-hmm. to hold it by the handle. <laughs> I smoke cigars with men who drink their bourbon or whiskey out of a small glass with, with a, a giant rock, chunk of yeah. ice, and they'll have yeah. one or two glasses. I'm like, what are you doing, bro? When, when you have progressive alcoholism like we do or drug addiction... Um, they, the drugs and the alcohol work to cover up your spiritual sickness and help you feel whole while they work. But on goes the years. And when it gets to a point, like his alcohol wasn't working for him anymore. And I remember like doing so much heroin. People that I'm doing drugs with would warn me and be like, Heather, don't do that. You're going to die. Like, how can you do so They had much? her doing heroin on a sheet of plastic by the end so they could roll her up when she died. In case I die. They just go ahead. And they yeah. were so scared of how much I could do. Right. Because I was tiny. And so I had to get high on a rug in the floor in case I died. Who got my car? And that's just the, and I'm just thinking, they're like, Heather, you're going to die. And I'm like, when? Yeah. Because, can you give me a time and a date this is just yeah. for it. old you yeah know? so so I'll, I'll wrap this up so i'm on a year probation i can't do drugs my drinking hits a whole new level i'm i'm able to drink a half gallon of crown royal in 24 to 36 hours so in a day to a day and a half i'm going through a, a half gallon of crown royal i can't stop no matter what there was a time period in there where i wanted to stop and couldn't uh, I had an RV at the time, and I used to go camping quite a bit. And the problem is that I can't burp. Have you ever heard me burp? Like, no. it'll happen every once in a while by accident, but I can't do it. You can't force yourself to do I it. Can't. You literally I, can't. So yeah, weird. I can't either. Huh. Yeah, she can. She's really good I'm at it. I'm great at it. Yeah. It's a skill. Um, God and so gift. W- if I'm drinking I'm beer. I'm sure he has other talents. <laughs> <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm drinking beer or if I'm drinking, like, Crown and Coke, the bubbles would make my stomach hurt. And so I would go camping. I don't want to drink, but I can't not. Right. And I remember one time leaving a grocery store and I stared at the, the the two to three cases of beer. I can't tell you how long. And when I finally left the grocery store, I had tears coming down my face because I couldn't not drink. I tried hypnotism. I tried everything and I couldn't stop drinking. And it wasn't till I was about 40 years old, a guy from my childhood came back into my life and he was different. He was sober. He was sober. And at this point in time as well, I am a hardcore militant atheist. Right. And I'm guessing everybody you hung out with is drinking, drugging. Like you don't oh, have a sober yeah. person in your life. When people talk about if you don't believe in Christ, you're going to hell. I'm like, bro, I've been there. Right. <laughs> yeah. I've well, been there. I've already visited. Yeah. Yeah. I've lived there. And the people I hung out with were there too. And we were completely separated from God, didn't believe in God and all of that. So my buddy like begins to work on me. And finally he just sets me down and he relates all the feelings. It wasn't the amount he drank. It wasn't what he put in his body. It was like, bro, I I felt invalidated. I felt empty, no contentment, no peace, no esteem, all of these things. I felt alone. He goes, I wanted to die. And I went, oh my God. So at night I would be laying in bed and I couldn't sleep. And I'd be thinking if I die in my sleep tonight, I'm okay with that. I was truly, truly okay with it. Just over it. I Just done. I couldn't live this way anymore. I was tired and I couldn't quit. And anyways, he, what we called 12-step me, began mm-hmm. to take me to meetings. I, what I love about this is that 
he Donnie thought he was going to those meetings just to support his sober friend. <laughs> just going as a friend. I was so delusional. He just had going as no a friend. No idea this guy's trying to hey, help. Whatever me it up. takes, man. Whatever yeah. it takes to get you there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was delusional. Um yeah. And so he began to take me to meetings and twelve step me into the program and my life. You know what it is? Let's end it with this. In the first seven days, I heard every kind of alcoholic talk about something. But on the seventh meeting, he took me to a meeting. He set his life on hold. And every single night would come pick me up and take me to a meeting. On the seventh night, we were in this place. We're at a meeting. And this guy says, I had no idea I was an alcoholic. His name was Gary. I still remember his name 10 years later. He says, I had a job. I had a wife, kids, two cars in the driveway, all the bills are paid, my house, everything is, looks great when you walk in front of my house. I didn't know I was an alcoholic, but inside I wanted to die. And I went, <gasps> oh my God. Like it was in that moment I went, that's me. And I identified with him. And I remember crying the entire way home that night. I cried when I got home. And it wasn't that I was an alcoholic that I was crying about. I was crying that I was an alcoholic. And here's what I mean by that. I finally, for the first time at 41 years old, knew what was wrong with me. And were you relieved that you knew or were you just broken because... I was relieved. It's just like when I was in rehab that I was fourth time and they finally explained the illness that I identified and I finally understood what had been wrong with me for 34 years. It's a profound oh. moment when you realize what illness you have. And, and, and because of everything I had been through in that 10 years prior to that... That night, I was like, here I am. What do you guys want me to do? I'll do it. Just tell me what to do. I was completely surrendered, completely willing to do whatever they told me to do because I couldn't live that way anymore. And now I knew what was wrong with me. And I'm seeing people that are happy, joyous, free. And I'm like, I want what you have. Yeah, so in that moment, it's like you have nowhere to go but up. Absolutely. Where before, you couldn't probably have gotten any lower. You might right. have felt like it just keeps getting worse, but there was never the hope that it was, it, oh, I see it. It could be this. But mm -hmm. like in this moment, there was something there that, that said, hey, there's here's something else we can offer you. For some reason, the the horrible gravity of understanding how hopeless the condition is that you have somehow provides hope because there's people that seem to have a way out. Yeah. Right. It, so if they can do it, then possibly. Then what did you do? Yeah, you can do it. If you Maybe. can just follow it. We, we have this saying. Um, this is what my first, that guy, this is what my first sponsor told me. He said, and I have this candle tattoo right here. And he said, here's why he said, I'm coming into this dark forest where you're alone and you can't find your way out. It's dark. You can't pitch black. You can't see, but I come in with a candle and I find you and I lead you out. When I go left, you go left. And when I go right, you go right. And when I go forward, you go forward, you follow me out and we get out to the road where there's light and I say, okay, are you okay? Dust you off. Cool, now let's go back in and get two more. And that is the life that, that we, we live, live today. Oh, you know, there's no way. I, there's no words I could say to sum it up. I mean, as you're saying that, I just had this picture of, of Jesus in the scripture about being the light. And mm. that's what he does. He comes in and the light might not be huge and bright. and You might not see the whole path, but it's just enough light. Mm -hmm. You go, I go right, you go right. Mm -hmm. I go left, you go left. You just stay with me. Mm-hmm. And we'll, then when we're good, we're we'll, going to go back. We're going to go out. More. But yeah. when we're good, I'm taking you and the tools I've given you, and now we're going back. Yep. I'm so excited to hear the rest <laughs> of the story. Okay, so you know what? Thank you guys for coming, and thank you even more for the fact that you're going to come again. Yeah. Because, yeah. because there's no way we're not going to finish this story. So um, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for the listeners today. Um, you're going to have the ability to link up to their podcast and their radio station. It'll be in the links um, from the episode. And make sure you come back for episode five. We're going to do Rescued by Grace, part two, Donnie Sober. We all need to hear the rest of the story. <laughs> this is amazing. So we will see you guys soon. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of Southern Soul Chats. We hope you found inspiration, encouragement, and valuable insights to carry with you through your week. We invite you to subscribe to Southern Soul Chat so that you never miss an episode. We are a branch of Stepping Forward Ministries, a 501c3 Christian nonprofit, and we kindly ask for you to consider making a donation today. Your contribution will play a vital role in sustaining the podcast and allowing us to continue sharing these impactful stories of faith. 
As you leave today, remember your story is a part of a bigger narrative and your faith has power to guide your path. Keep stepping forward with hope, trust, and assurance that you're never alone. This is Dr. Miranda Ferguson. We hope you have a great week and keep stepping forward.